Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Jennifer Fitzpatrick. She is the author of Cruising Through Caregiving. And offline, I just explained to her why I could use a little cruising today. She is also a professor of gerontology at John Hopkins University. So, you know, just a little little smarts behind this gal today. So thanks for joining me today, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. It's always talk, nice to talk to another Jennifer. Yeah, I know. It makes it very easy to remember who I'm talking yes. about. Yes. <laughs> so how did you decide to write the book? Do you have a personal experience with dealing with memory loss? She's shaking her head. Yes. So I have a both personal and professional experience dealing with caregiving. So I, I've been working in healthcare, senior living, one way or another since I was 16, and I'm 46 now. So I worked in high school, I worked in a nursing home, and I you know, spent a lot of time around older adults that were sick, a lot with cognitive impairment. But I've been a caregiver several times also, but really inspired because I felt like so many times I was hearing the same story over and over and over again from family caregivers who were giving up everything for caregiving you know their their relationship with their spouse their not spending time with their grown kids or their grandkids or even maybe they still have little kids at home they're not spending time with them they are missing out on their friendships they might leave their jobs that they like and i wanted people to know that it of course caregiving is never a vacation but if you want to, if you make a point to try, you can, I say, cruise a little bit more smoothly through the process. And so every chapter is a different way to reduce your stress. I probably should have read that before dealing with my mom yesterday. <laughs> well, it's not too late. I'm going to send you one. Oh, I appreciate that. I am developing a library that somehow I will share with other caregivers. I have That's a great idea how to do that specifically just yet, but I have a lot of books that have been very helpful and you know, I'm not gonna hoard them. So I appreciate that. So who who did, you said you have done caregiving twice. Who was that for parents? Well, so, <coughs> so I was, I've done short-term caregiving and long-term caregiving. So my grandma, short term she broke her shoulders when i was in my early 20s both of her shoulders at the same time oh, that's and nasty so my yeah it was it was crazy and think about all the stuff you can't do and you don't have your arms you don't have your hands you don't have your shoulders and it was only for four weeks and i learned a lot that was probably my first caregiving experience but my aunts and i we committed to her that we would do everything for her in the four week period and but because she didn't want my grandfather helping her in the bathroom or anything like that. And so my aunts took off work during the week. And then I came up on weekends because I lived about two hours away. But it was such an incredible experience for me because my grandmother was cognitively intact. She's one of my closest friends. I was happy to do it. But I was doing 48 hours where she could tell me what she needed. But I was still completely exhausted at the end of the 48 hours. And I, it gave me such insight. This happened, you know, in my early twenties, it gave me so much insight to what people like you go through when you're dealing it with it for a decade. And if the person has dementia and they can't tell you what they need, she could say, I'm in the mood for a sandwich or I'm hot, turn on the fan. So that was one experience. And then my grandmother-in-law, my grandfather, my dad with some mental health, uh, stuff caregiving in that respect. So yeah, there's been a lot of different kinds of caregiving and I am really grateful that, you know, I've had a professional experience because it also gives me a lot of empathy for people who've never worked in healthcare. Because if, if it's hard for those of us who have experience and we know about resources, it, it's so hard for people who don't know any of that. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to write Cruising Through Caregiving. Awesome. Well, I can relate to the broken shoulders. I, in May of 2016, I flew off my bicycle and broke my, broke my collarbone. 
Ooh. Yeah. And it's the only bone I've ever broken, thank goodness, knock on wood. And, you know, thankfully it was summer, so I wore elastic waist um, exercise shorts that were a little big, so it wasn't super easy to get them up and down. <laughs> but my husband did have to hold the hair dryer while I used the brush because I was not spending three months not being able to style my right. hair. Yeah. And I think just recently he said I was drying my hair, you know, normally again. And he's like, I kind of missed that. And I was like, are you crazy? Uh, it was a bonding experience. I guess. I just thought it was like the only way I could like get, leave the house looking at least halfway decent. I mean, I had to wear a strapless bra for months and ugh, it was terrible. So I can relate. And I only had the one. So I cannot, I remember the one time when the entire family just sort of abandoned me. And I'm like, well, I'll just make my own sandwich. And so I'm trying to put the mayonnaise on the bread as it's sliding around the counter. I'm like, help. It's, it, yeah, it was really eye-opening, that experience. And, you know, you experienced half of it. It's, it's, that was really tough for her. Yeah, I can't imagine both. How did she manage to break both shoulders? That sounds horrible. She fell forward. She was at uh, my husband, my, my cousin, my cousin's football game. He was in high school and he, he, she was slipped on some mud, fell forward. And, I, you know, the thing about it is that we had an end date in sight and that you could say, all right, in four weeks, she's going to be able to do this again for herself. And she knew it. We knew it. And so many caregiving experiences are not like that. There's no end date in sight where your job's going to be done. Yeah. That's, that's the one thing I, you know, when I've talked to people and I tell them, you know, we've been doing this for like probably around 20 years and regular listeners will know that I actually think that my mom started showing signs of memory issues when she was 52 and a half, and I just recently turned 53, so she was the age I'm at now, which was in the summer of 1995. Okay, this is the end of 2019. You guys do the math, because <laughs> I don't want to do the math. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, and like we were talking offline, people say, oh, well, you know, you should, you know, be th thankfully you still have your mom. I lost mine three years ago. It's like, yeah, I lost mine way back when I mean I I don't remember not having issues related to her memory because we had a business together and everybody knows this people think I'm gonna have Alzheimer's because I tell the same story I'm gonna have to think on a new one she would take orders from clients with no instructions due dates no no way for anybody else to complete it which you know occasionally I'm sure we all do that but it just got worse and worse. And then one day she, I, I found one of these orders and I said, you know, what are we supposed to be doing for Jen Fitzpatrick here? And she looked at it. She goes, I don't know. That's so-and-so's handwriting. And I'm like, uh, nope. The employee's handwriting was loopy and mom's was very angular. It wasn't a person running past the two orders would not have mistaken them together. My, my handwriting, my mom's, yeah, I could see how you'd mix them up. Not, not, not her and the employee. So that was like, that was not a fun, fun morning. Cause I basically, you know, she said, well, I don't want to end up like my mother. My grandmother also had no memories at the end of her life. And then she stomped away from me and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Kill you? Cause I have pretty, pretty strong feelings is where we're going. And that was in the early two thousands. Uh. So I'm seriously, I'm ready for some cruising. So what, um, I know, let me, I'm going to ask a question. I don't know. I'm throwing, I'm throwing her under the bus with this question. I have a friend whose father has Louie body and he seems to be very adversely affected during the full moon. And I mean, like literally just kind of goes off the deep end and it just, it, she's older and it just, he's 93. So I'm not sure how old she is, but she's older than I am. It's just, it's just exhausting. And I think that's fascinating, but also super frustrating. So I don't know if you have advice for, I mean, ideas of why that would happen, any advice? So I don't have any evidence of this, but my massage therapist 
tells me that I text her when there's a full moon and I don't realize it. Like that I'm having muscle aches more than usual. Interesting. If people swear by that, I, I don't have any evidence to support it or back it up. But I think what is important is if she's noticing a trend, whatever the trend is, you said full moon, it could be when it's raining out. It could be when it's the holiday season. It could be when little kids are around, but she's noticing a trend. And so I think what's really important is for her to plan for those trends if there's behaviors that she's seeing associated. So whether or not you or I or anybody else believes in that full moon phenomena, that's really not relevant. She's seeing it. And so it might be, if I talked to her, I would probably ask her, what are you doing during that time to, to make the situation a little bit better? Are you bringing help in? Are you, what are you doing to try to, to ease those behavioral issues? Well, that's good. And I'm going to suggest that to her. He does go to um, senior day program. I think it's four days a week. Of course, in November of this month, or no, December, I'm already losing my mind. <laughs> no, you're not. You're just um, tired. You he, saw your mom yesterday and yeah, you're tired. Whew, four hours was too much. He, he, um, he couldn't go to day, daycare. That's what she calls it. I try not to call it that. Because I wish they would come up with a new name. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, some people call it like club. Mm -hmm. Other people have names for it, but um, she, he was congested and she was pretty sure that he had a cold and she didn't want to take him to the senior program because she didn't want to infect anybody else, which, you know, blessings to her. Right. He said, you know, on the full moon and it just affects his behavior and, and she can't get rid of him for a few hours a day. <laughs> she was just, Bleh. so I will suggest to her, I'll ask her if you, uh, if she's, if she's says so she knows this happens and it's and it is every single month if she's planning you know like think about it like what has he done in the past six months and see if there's a way to adjust what they're doing so other than well, whether <laughs> whether so and i i of course it's lovely and i applaud her for trying to keep her him away from the other folks at the center but because he was ill physically ill but i would say as much as possible, don't disrupt his routine if she can help it next month. Doing that, and I would say if she's noticing whatever again times a day, times of month, where there's more issues, maybe look into bringing in a little bit more support, a little bit more help, and then also whether she bring more family helps or friends or she hires help. But then also, what is she doing to reduce her stress after these difficult periods? Is she, maybe she you hire somebody or, you know, she, he's going four days a week. Maybe it's time to up it to five. Yeah. I'm not sure they're open five. Okay. But I will, and I know she has people that help at their house. And yep. cause she had commented to another gal who's in our support group, whose husband also attends the same program. She says, I don't know how you do this because this gal is taking care of her husband full time. She's actually had nothing but problems with caregivers. I guess he's very tall and I guess, I don't know. I know she's had a lot of issues with getting people that can actually help her with what he needs help with. So one friend was commenting to the other, like, I don't know how you do this. And then I feel guilty because my mom is in a memory residence. And so if I don't want to deal with it, I guess I could just say, no, nah, I'm not dealing with it today. That is not how I, it's not how I roll, but they're days. Jennifer, <laughs> you know what you're talking about? It sounds like it sounds like it might be time for her to consider what your mom has. It's I think what I always say to people is like on a on a regular basis, you want to be assessing zero to one hundred. Where's your stress level as a caregiver? So zero, meaning you're on some really great drugs or <laughs> you're dead. And then 100 means you are about to collapse. So you can't take any more stress. And if you're repeatedly 70, 80, 90, 
what are you going to do in the next week or month to reduce it incrementally just a little bit? What are you going to do to just reduce it a little bit? And there's all kinds of things that we can do, right? But if you're repeatedly at those high levels of stress, I love adult day. Listen, I do. I, and I don't love the name, but I don't love adult day care, but I love the concept. I actually have run an adult day. But I think that and it's a great, it's a great deal financially. You know, it's, it's a great deal. It's one of the best bangs for your buck in, in the world of caregiving healthcare. But it's a lot of work. You have to get the person up and ready and dressed. And you brought up the great point. Your friend was very mindful. He's got a cold. He's ill. I don't want to take him. I don't want to infect others. That's very lovely. But then, you, you know, he's got to come home. And, and it's, it's, I think it's great for a lot of people for a long time. But there, for many people, especially with Louis body, it does come to a point where it's time for the next level. And that's probably senior living. I think a lot of people, I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, you're 20 years in, 25 years in, whatever. I, I'm really glad that you took the plunge. I think a lot of families wait too long until their health is awful. Their mental health is not good. They, they're mad at, you know, spiritually, they're a mess. So I think it's, it's so, a lot of times home is not the best place for your loved one who has dementia. The reason we made that choice, my dad passed away just after my 50th birthday. And I found out that he just assumed she'd come live with me. Yeah. Huh. Oh, sure. Why not? Yeah. Well, it was like, and which was really ludicrous because one, he never discussed it with me. So I'm still <laughs> mad at him. You know, almost three years later, still want to, I can't dig him up. He was cremated, but I say dig him up and beat him up. So <laughs> And two, he died March 2nd, 2017. My daughter moved out February 1st, 2017. So in his lifespan that he could remember, because at the very end, his memory was also the pits, I didn't have a room. My husband and I are self-employed, and it's like, I'm sorry, I am 50 years old. I'm really feeling old now, because now I'm 53. <laughs> and we finally got rid of the kid, and I'm like... My maternal grandmother lived to 91. So I am not, my mom was 75. So I'm like, I'm not waiting another 15 or 20 years to have a life because Lord knows what, you know, might be wrong with me when I'm in my 70s. No, thank you. And I also knew, again, as I mentioned, I have one child because that's all I could deal with. There's no way I could deal with my mom. I knew at the end of one week of dealing with her because when my dad was um, in the hospital, mom, and this is the worst thing possible for somebody with memory loss, but we had to bounce her. She was at my sister's house. She was at my house. She was at her home with her sister, who is um, eight or 11 years younger. I always forget. And so there was all this upheaval and confusion, which you know was bad enough for those of us that don't have cognitive issues, but for her, it was just dramatic. But Everything was a trial and the stress level from, you know, my dad in the hospital and, and bouncing her around and, you know, just getting her in the shower or, you know, she'd open the bedroom door and let the dog out in the middle of the night and the dog would pee on the floor. I have three golden retrievers. I did not need a fourth dog peeing in the house. I'm like, well, I knew after a week, one of us would be dead. So my sister and I had discussed some options our aunt, mom's sister, had taken care of their mom until grandma died. And I will never understand what in the hell happened with this family. But they let her take care of their mom, living on grandma's social security. So when my grandmother died, my aunt ended up destitute. So she's on welfare. She's on Section 8. Uh -huh. It's like, are you kidding me, people? Not cool. So my sister and I had thought, Perhaps it would be beneficial if my aunt moved into my parents' house. She took care of mom. We would hire a caregiver for at least eight hours a day because, you know, she shouldn't have to deal with that 24 hours a day again. And then I am a very planning person. I, I like to know, 
like the path all laid out, which I've learned is never happens. And I started thinking about it and I'm like, okay, well, my mom is significantly older. Her mind is not good. You know, I can't imagine my aunt going first. So if my aunt, if my mom dies and my aunt's still around and she's living in my mom's house, she has to, you know, wait two or three years to get back on vouchered home housing. So she'd be living in my parents' house. There's expenses there. You know, so I, I thought of like the absolute worst case scenarios, like what could be the worst possible things that happen. And I was like, mm, I don't want to go through this. So I started looking at assisted living residences. There's one literally a mile down the hill from my house. I wish it was better. That'd be really nice if mom was that close, but she's not. It's also like right next door to her doctor, which would have been really great. Uh. Anyway, so I found the one that she's at. They said, oh, yes, she could keep her dog. I was like, money, here's a deposit. <laughs> when can I move her in? <laughs> it was just like, you know, I didn't do all the vetting. I got very lucky. I went in with gut instinct. And so far, she's been there almost three years. It's been great. Um, I don't. There's so much about, sorry, there's so much about what you just said, though, that is, is right on target so much you know for one you said this is not going to work for me and so many adult kids especially daughters they don't give it that critical thought and what if this is another 10 years 20 years you did math you i really applaud you jennifer because i can't tell you how many people don't do any of that critical thinking they make the decision all based on emotion. And you did such a good job. The other part of what you said that I really just was so smart is so often people choose senior living community based on geography. Now, of course, we don't want the person four hours away. But yeah, it would be great if it was a mile away. But it's not the right fit for whatever reason. And you, you picked the one that was the right fit. It's very tempting to try to make it work. It's close, it's next to the doctor. If it wasn't the right place for her for a variety of reasons, you avoided a big mistake in having to move her again. So I, I really applaud everything you just said. Thank you. Like I said, I didn't do a lot of the vetting and I didn't look around that much. There are a couple other places. But that's okay. I, that's okay, it, you found what you were looking for. I guess so. Like I said, so far, I've not had any issues. I mean, like I said, I think this was offline. You know, she's really declined a lot in the last seven, eight months. And the staff is still very surprised that she gets verbally aggressive with them when they have to insist on helping her with her shower or changing. It offends her. She gets angry. It is, it's so frustrating. So when I went to pick her up yesterday, she was sitting in the dining room and she seemed happy and she was thrilled to see me. I'm her best friend and she knows we're going to go out. So seeing me is always a positive, which is great because it doesn't last forever. The caregiver who has the unfortunate job of showering my mom obviously had taken care of that process yesterday morning because my mom was not happy with that gal. <laughs> And she was telling me, oh, mom needs this, mom needs that. Can you, can you bring these things back when you bring mom back? And I said, oh, sure, we're chatting. And my mom goes, we don't have to listen to her. Anything she says. <laughs> and then she stops off and I'm like, oh, apparently she's angry with you this today. And she's like, yeah, she called me, a, you know, B-I-T-C-H. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. And they're like, she was so sweet and so easy to deal with. I'm like, you didn't grow up with her. Like she was sweet and easy to deal with as long as you did things her way. You ticked my mom off, man. You were, you were looking for that line. What, where, where was that line I crossed? I got to get back over it. You know, I mean, she wasn't, you know, abusive or anything as a parent. Right. She, was not, you she know. wasn't easy all the time. No. I mean, and it's, most parents are not. And no. most parents are not. Most of us are not. Yeah. So they're all, and I'm surprised it's been like eight months and they're still shocked that she, you know, swears at them or fights with them. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should have warned you people that that would happen. But 
I guess I wasn't, you know, not having dealt with my grandmother in that capacity. I wasn't aware of what may or may not happen with my mom. That's the, that's the really hard thing is it's like literally I went to visit her on, on, you know, my typical Monday. I had run into um, a husband and a wife at the gas station and they're like, Oh, we've just come from visiting her mom. We were visiting with your mom, blah, 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 blah. Big conversation at the gas station. <laughs> and so I knew that she'd already had quite an active late morning, early afternoon. So I get there and she's just loopy and tired and grumpy. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do this one little errand. And then we're just going to keep it short today because she just is out of it. And it's just, it's not going to get better from here. The next day the staff called and said, your mom is still out of it. She's very dizzy. And I'm like, she's got a UTI. I have no, I've done enough research. This overnight change in behavior got to be that. It wasn't. She just went whoop and declined like all at once. Big decline. And there are days I think, okay, we kind of stabilized at this new level, but there are days I'm not so sure that we stabilized. It's, I don't know, like I said, she was very grumpy with the caregiver yesterday, so that doesn't help. And then we went to the Rotary meeting to listen to the the high school kids singing the Christmas carols and it gets very loud. There's almost a hundred of us. So yeah. You were saying, yeah, there's a lot of us. And she, this is the first time I've heard her complain about the noise level in a long time, which is something she used to do. I mean, we had to stop going out for dinner for people's birthdays because I don't know, they don't make restaurants that are relatively quiet that don't cost three arms and a leg. And she would just literally complain about the volume, like every five minutes. Oh my God, it's so loud in here. Oh my God, it's so loud. It's like after a while, you'd be like, okay, can we please leave? Because I can't take But you're smart because, you know, in cruising through caregiving, I constantly talk about course correcting. If it's not working, stop it, pivot, stop going out to dinner. And you're so smart, Jennifer, because there are people that will be like, my mom loves to go out to eat. We're not stopping. And it's, it's amazing because, well, maybe she did, but now she, she's different and she doesn't like the noise. And uh, the only thing that I would say is check out Dementia Friendly America because they have a listing of restaurants that are dementia uh, friendly. So I don't know. I, you, you know, it might not work for your mom. I know for some people it's, it's like they get a certification that they've had the training and that they, but, and I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but it might be an option, but maybe you just keep doing what you're doing and you find other activities. That's been my biggest challenge is making a note here. Um, you know, so yesterday I took her, picked her up, you know, and I was, she asked if what she was wearing was okay. And it was very, Okay, I'm in Northern California, so when I say cold and foggy, bear with me, because... <laughs> what was it, 60? <laughs> well, I think it was like mid-50s, upper 50s. <laughs> but it didn't God, get it's like 30 us. here. Oh, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> Not my idea of uh, livable. <laughs> I tell people, that's why I like my high-tax state, because where I live, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can go to the desert, the mountains, the beach, the Sierras, whatever. You want to pick it, you can drive there. And it's just, you know, not bad. Did I, did I lose you? Oh, there we go. You froze up on me for a second there. Anyway, so I took her. She, she wanted to know if what she was wearing was fine. And I said, well, it's kind of cold out. You know, maybe you want to put on this sweater. And I found a sweater that was thicker and it was a little more festive. So that worked out really well. Didn't have to argue. With, I wasn't going to argue with her about changing her clothes. Whatever she was wearing was how we were going to go. So after the meeting... We went downtown to look at all the decorated Christmas trees and her biggest issue, and we did, Jennifer and I did talk about this offline a little bit, is her visual processing is so bad that any change visually in the walkways throws her off. I mean, she pretty much bends over and watches her feet because she's afraid of falling. Now, a past guest suggested that I have her looked at for cataracts and I'm going to talk to her neurologist about somebody to do that. 
I hesitate on if she does have cataracts, do I do the surgery to improve? Oh, it's such a hard decision. Yeah. Because it's like the, we're looking at Christmas trees and they're all, they were all like six feet tall. Some of them had, you know, head sized ornaments, big bows. I mean, just like very large decorations. And I'm, that's making it sound like it wasn't, they're beautiful. And one of them had, um, hummingbirds hummingbird feeders and hummingbird decorations they were super cute and they weren't little and i'm like oh look at this is so sweet with hummingbirds on and she's just like looking around so i actually took it off the tree i'm like see and she i don't think she could see it now is it because her brain is not processing the information that's going in does she not really see so i'm hoping i get an answer to that in the near future and then I can figure out what to do if I do get an answer that she has cataracts because walking places, even though she's physically capable of walking like a normal person, and I know somebody might find that term offensive, she doesn't. And it's frustrating because she will stop at a curb and there's a lot of thinking on how to step up a curb. And a oh yeah, yeah. Which it's normal? She's. We're. I've been working on it. She absolutely does not want help. So she does not want to take. She does not want to hold my hand. She does not want to take my elbow. And over the summer, you know, she basically will lean on hot cars to step down one curb into the parking lots. Which you know, hello, hot. Stop that. Also, you know, I'm not worried about her damaging somebody's car, but. I think, you know, after a while, people are like, what's with this old lady, like, groping my car? And now, do I, you... don't, I don't want her to get burned. So I've learned if I hold my hand up like this and say, would you use my hand for balance? She will do it reluctantly. So we're getting there, hoping to work on that some more. That way she's not, she will literally stop at a curb and be like, whoa. And it's like, I got to grab her because she's her, she overreacts so badly and she's going to fling herself on the ground. <laughs> well, you know, being concerned about her safety is important. But as far as somebody else, have you utilized the cards from the Alzheimer's Association? Yeah. You do have them? I do. And I'm actually going to make, I'm going to make some new ones for me. And I think I'm going to share them with our support group because everybody this past month was like, oh, we need more of those cards. And I think the facilitator gave them all out. You know, but occasionally when you're in a parking lot and she's literally, yeah, you, you know, going be from car to safety. car, yeah, I can understand how somebody would be like, "What the heck? What's what these yeah. oh. ladies over here?" You know, and like I said, I'm not worried in the slightest about her damaging somebody's car. I'm worried about her getting burned, exactly. You know, or it being hot and then her overreacting to that. And oh lord, I don't know. So <laughs> it's just so much fun. So what other advice do you have for people like me and all the listeners on how to, how to, what I find is people like I'm in this situation. Okay. So today is September, September, like you said, I'm tired. December 17th, 2019, this will come out after the holidays and I am dealing with the guilty feelings of if I don't spend Christmas Eve with my mother, that makes me this horrible person. But if I spend Christmas Eve with my mother, I will not have a good time. And at right. some point I'm trying to figure out, you know, she has no clue what day it is. So I'm, there's an event at the community she lives in. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, you are asking a great question. Okay, good. It's a really, really good question. So, I would say you got to have a balance and I would really look at if your mother, first of all, if you're thinking of bringing your mom with you to an event, is it going to be like, you've already discovered trial and error. She's not good at restaurants anymore. And for, for, for the holidays, like what you went and go, go listen to the music and look at the decorations. She didn't seem like it was, it was the best fit. You know, you might want to look at like, what are you thinking of bringing her to? So I think 
as long as you're celebrating with her in some way, I think you're all set. So let's say maybe you and your husband and your daughter, maybe you're going to go have lunch one day. And I don't know how aware your mom is of the actual day of the week. It's definitely Christmas Eve. It's, it's Hanukkah. It's New Year's Day. Um, but if she's not, you can play around with that and go celebrate. Hey, we're celebrating Christmas today. We're celebrating Hanukkah today. We're celebrating it's, it's New Year's. Pick the day that you want to do it and make that celebration. Give her her presents. And I think for a lot of people with dementia, not taking them out of their routine can sometimes be the best thing for them. Or if they're, like you said, if they're having a nice big event at the, the community where she resides and she enjoys that, maybe you go to that. But I think that family caregivers are just so wrapped up in what they should do at the holidays, what we have to do, what she will be mad at me if we don't do this, or my, gosh, my dad would be so hurt if he knew that I didn't take mom here. You got to let all that go and say, what's she going to actually enjoy? And then we deserve to have a good holiday too. You and your husband and your daughter and whoever the extended family is, you know, if you bring her to a family function where there's a lot of lights and toys and small children and, and music, you know, it might be a miserable mess. And I think when families do that to themselves and they, a lot of them, they know, they know ahead of time, but they do it anyway. So I would say that what you want to really think about is what is something you can do to celebrate with her. That's going to make everybody feel good. And then also you and your family deserve a happy holiday also. So you got to, you got to really let yourself off the hook. In fact, one of the chapters in Cruising Through Caregiving, um, the chapter is called um, uh, Let Yourself Off the Hook. That sounds like a definitely a good one for people to listen to or listen to. Read and pay attention to because it is really hard. I mean, I know she has no clue what day of the week it is, what day it is, time, season, year, none of that. I could skip Christmas and you know only the people around her like the caregivers or other family members and i do all you know i go on my own my sister goes different day they're the only people that would know so but i still feel like i feel guilty because i would like for her to enjoy the holidays but i also know she probably won't and i would like to enjoy the holidays which means i probably should just leave her where she's at so i think this year I'm going to go either on the 22nd to the party that they're having in her residence or on Monday, the 23rd, when I normally go and we'll figure out something. Although my husband after yesterday is like, mom has had enough holiday, <laughs> which she might have. Well, and that's something to think about too, Jennifer, because I think if you feel okay with with what you know, you're going to go on the 22nd, there's going to be a party, there's going to be... It's enough. It's enough. You know, think about your, everybody that's a family caregiver, anybody that's listening to this program, you're doing probably way more than most people out there. Because the truth is there are, you know this, you go see your mom. There are people that have no visitors mm -hmm. but once a year. You're going a, on a consistent basis that you're actually thinking about what would she enjoy? What would she not enjoy? I, it sounds to me like that's the right plan. Go to her, her celebration, especially, you know, I think a lot of families, oh my gosh, she's going to be sitting there on the 24th and oh my, we used to go to midnight mass and she's going to be wondering why. If she's not in that headspace anymore, you, it's about you and we have to let that go. I think that's excellent advice. So that's probably a good place to stop because I think you have to go, right? And if you have any last tidbit that you can offer, that would be great. But other than that, I really think everybody should definitely check out Cruising Through Caregiving because those of us doing it know it is no cruise. It is no picnic. 
And Jennifer obviously has experience and advice that we should all take in to heart, especially me. <laughs> so the the you can get a free chapter at cruisingthroughcaregiving.com and also there um I don't know if you're aware of hilarity for charity. Separate. Yes. Okay. So um my I as along with a company called Oasis Senior Advisors, they sponsored it. Polarity for Charity and I, as well as Oasis, we did 15 weeks of a virtual book club for dementia caregivers over the summer. And all of the videos from that can be found at cruisingthroughcaregiving.com. We had guests from the Alzheimer's Association, from AARP, from Argentum, from National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, among others. And so every, every week for 15 weeks, and it's all free, it's on YouTube, it's on my website and Hilarity for Charity's website, um, you can look at the, the week on work and caregiving, the week on choosing a community and caregiving, the week, although you gave so many great tips today, honestly, I mean, that, I, I mean you, you really get it. And then the other part of it is, uh, the, I mean, there's just a, a chapter on the late stages, like when the person's you know, their body's starting to shut down because they do pass away. So the only last thought I'm going to leave you with is you deserve to have a happy holiday. You deserve to have a less stressful 2020. We're entering a new decade. And if you're listening to this program, you deserve wherever your stress level is today, zero to 100, it can, you can reduce it but you have to want to reduce it. You have to make that one of your decisions for the new year. So think about what are some of the small things that you can do in the next month, in the next three months, first quarter of the year to reduce the stress of being a caregiver. That is excellent. Think about what you can do, and make a plan. And hopefully your plans work out better than I've learned. Make a plan. It's a great way for you to find a different path. <laughs> Make a plan, but then, you know, it, maybe it works the, the whole way that you want it to. And then maybe it's, you know, it's, I think some plan is better than no plan. Like, and, and when I say that, I mean, what if you're going to research adult day, research home care agencies, Visit two assisted livings for when you need it. Do something that gives you peace of mind that, all right, when my loved one gets to this point, I have some, some uh, tricks up my sleeve. I have some options. But I think a lot of people say, oh my gosh, all of a sudden there's this big event crisis and I don't know what to do anymore. And so um, I don't mean that you have to go on a three-week vacation. I don't, I'm not saying that, but what small things can you do to, to put your mind at ease this new year? That sounds awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on with me today and I will have all the links to your YouTube and website, you. all that good stuff in the show notes. So people can click through and, and check out those videos. In addition, you know, I have episodes on choosing in-home care and choosing a, a residence, you know, a care residence, all that good stuff. So you can get multiple ideas and opinions that'll help you guide your planning into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.